So while you guys line up on either side here with questions, um, I, I asked the panelists to ask questions of themselves. But before I start, I noticed a couple of overarching uh, questions that uh, reach beyond uh, uh, you know, just one of you. Uh, and one with, we have two students who basically went into business and started up business. And I noticed both of you were saying that you were trying to minimize the IP at the university. Um, and that led me to think, well, how did you, first of all, you know, we want to encourage people like you and your generation to start up new businesses. Uh, so is the university, uh, did it help you move into the firm or was it uh, something you had to get around like putting all your stuff out in the public domain so you didn't have to negotiate? Unmute, there we go. So McGill is actually incredibly helpful in, in supporting our endeavor. I mean, uh, I mean they, they basically gave us everything we needed and they never, the, the concern for IP was really our, our cautious, like our, our own caution on our part. There was never a, any mention of it. I mean, I'm sure it's important and you know, more, most ventures do fail, so there's, there's no point in you know, putting, putting up a, a, a ruckus you know, if, if nothing's gonna come of it. So who knows if down the line uh, a, a, a unicorn company comes out of a university, what's gonna happen really. But I think the approach that McGill has taken that we've seen so far has been really supportive and, and helpful. And so we're really grateful for that. So it's a really great uh, point that you make. Um, actually, in my case, uh, we didn't have the choice because uh, like the lab that I'm coming from, uh, everything is public uh, usually and the code as well. So, um, so it was not like a, a specific question to say like, are we going to release the code or to, to evade uh, the, uh, the IP? Um, although you need to protect it at some point or another, if it's for investors or others, they will ask you like, do you possess that IP or do you have a way to protect it uh, down the line? So in our case, uh, we decided anyway, like things move very fast. So the stuff that we, we were doing uh, in academia uh, is now, uh, like we've evolved from that, we've recorded everything. Uh, I think we have better tools now uh, and that will change also in time. So, so there was no real point to set deals with the university at that point. Uh, and now we own the IP. So, so yeah, there was no big discussion, but it's always the, a little bit, stressful or you don't know like if that company becomes a very big company are they going to sue you or something uh, down the line because like they see the, the dollar signs uh, so that's still a, a big question mark for me uh, it's not clear exactly well from the path that we've took I think it's we've avoided that but uh, <laughs> you never know so let me ask a, a second uh, question this is more general is all of you have talked about some of the stuff being shared and open, creating data structures and uh, sustainability of, of that information, and at the same time needing to have a firm that uh, takes off and has some exclusivity, some advantage in the marketplace. Where did you learn to figure out that line, or are you still learning, or where does that information come from? Go to any anybody on the panel. I mean, I, I, I don't mind. Um, so we're definitely still learning, but from from the get go, we were a, a very academic oriented group uh, of scientists, basically, um, and so we we are very much proponents of open science. And so our dream really was to make it such that the IP that we create is not really relevant to our ability to disseminate the knowledge and the science and, and the data if, if possible. So we just, like, if you could just turn like super technical <laughs> details pr proprietary but release all of the knowledge that's created out, out of your algorithms and the models themselves and the code, then uh, I don't know if it's gonna work but that's, I'm really hoping it might, yeah. So basically, how do you, uh, because I mean, those little details are what makes the difference at the end. Like yeah. in, some, in some cases, like uh, sharing a model uh, is 
it can be useful, but it's not necessarily the, 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 the it's not going to, yeah, exactly. It's, it's important, like at the end, you need to protect it, I think, at some point. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's something that we've, uh, on our side, uh, learned in the, the past few months, uh, doing like exactly trying to figure out what will be the, the business value, what's, uh, how to protect our, our IP, how to make value from what we've learned, and also from the data as well, like uh, how do we gather public and private data, how do we de-silo some of, uh, of that data that can be very useful and that should be leveraged uh, in academia and in the private sector. Uh, I think uh, you have a very interesting approach for that. Uh, you know, I, I think, first of all, it's a very slippery slope. And we were talking earlier about this. If you don't have a framework where you can, you can secure the data into a compliant format so one or more people can share it work together, then you don't have a framework. So it's a slippery slope, you're moving forward and you're always looking over your shoulder to see what did I do or what I did not do. So I mean, for example, we've recently at MGH in Boston, we've recently, uh, we helped them develop a molecular lab and we set up a small company, we're taking that company to market uh, and their objective is to use the IP generated at Mass General Hospital, then allow other people, perhaps open science, to mix other molecular medicine components into the mix and then harden the solution using a company called Archer to take those assays and take them to market. So sometimes it's an acceleration, but you know we all started in small businesses. I had two to three of them and I've got the scars to bear uh, from starting them because when you're running and gunning and you're just trying to make a living and move forward, you, know, you don't necessarily have the benefit of this great uh, legal group that's here. So I think to begin with an auditable system where you can contain, mix the data, uh, read only, scratch capability, and then preserve it. You know, preservation of data always helps those who are trying to do the right thing to begin with. Uh, so uh, I think the kind of system we're talking about is foundational to this. So, so another sort of critical tension that really matters here is um, where your data is coming from and who it's coming from. Um, if you have end users who are consumers, uh, you know, you have to be very careful or you might end up being 23 and me selling people's genetic data to Big Pharma. Um, if you are collecting data from consumers, you have to be very, very f uh, forthright with what you're going to do with it. And um, especially if you want to share it within an open science framework, you have to be careful about that. Um, you know, this is particularly true of neuroimaging data where the de-identification process is, is a, sort of a critically important part if you're doing um, open science, if you're sharing or, or, or aggregating anything. Um, we've had requests from people who say, you know, We'd love to see some of the EEG data that you've got. Can you share it with us? And it's an academic lab, and so you know we're we're open to collaborating with them. And they say, I want to build the, you know, I want to try and train a, a classifier on uh, unique brain prints so that I can identify individual users on EEG. It's like, of course we're not going to share that with you. Are you crazy? Why would we do that? It'd violate your users' privacy. So you have to be very forthright with your users. And there are frameworks for this. Sage BioNetworks is particularly good at this, on um, uh, you know patient-centered or user-centered privacy. Uh, making things very easy for the end user to understand, understand what they're sharing, and then be very careful about what you're doing, the sharing, or uh, what you're doing with the data. Uh, and you know, I think it, there's there's no easy answer to this. It's going to be solved on a case by case basis for now. Uh, and the it's really really important that the community engages with that, especially you know people who have a lot of experience in standardizing and sharing data engage with companies that have this increasingly uh, common problem or challenge. Yeah, no, so the other thing that <clears throat> sorry, that goes along with that, um, you know, w with that standardization and pooling of data is that um, as there's more and more to work with, as it becomes more and more of an issue, um, privacy preserving software can become much more important. I think it's, uh, it's going to be a growing field that's going to really accelerate the development of all the other fields because it's going to allow access to a lot of data. And those who can show that their systems really do protect that privacy uh, will have an edge in terms of access to data. Um, in terms of open sourcing, I think there's always two things to look at. And the way that you open source data and the, the way that you open source tools and other software are two very different things. I think it takes two different policies and approaches um, towards them. You know, as you said, the, the trust that you have when you're a data collector is very important. Once you lose it, you, it's very, very hard to regain it. Um, and what, we, what we've noticed is that being a trusted data partner on the market today is very, very valuable. 
so that's one area where you want to be much more careful than, let's say, your open source tools. In terms of open sourcing tools and your, your software, I mean, there's always a, a trade-off between where your expertise lies and where other innovations are happening in other labs and you want to be a part of it. And in order to be a part of it, one, you have to you know, be a, a, a good community member. But the other thing is if you take one version of it and you go off on your side and you sort of fork it and start building it on your own, you're not going to be able to take advantage of a lot of the innovations that are happening anyway. So I think very much case by case, I think it's very much a difficult thing, but it's about recognizing where your particular value lies uh, and how to protect that while taking advantage of the, the other innovations that are going on. And um, I think AI being a, a field where it's very resource constrained at the moment, knowing how to apply those tools, even if they are open source, or having access to particular data, even if the models are open source, that can be your competitive edge that can allow you to, to contribute the rest back to the community. Actually, that's a great point, so I was gonna sort of come off of that and actually talk about a point that Graham raised as well, is that one of the things that we, t we tend to downplay in doing this is how much effort we put into actually developing the platform, so our own sort of expertise and personal skills that provided that platform. And you can obviously reverse en engineer a lot of software packages, but actually figuring out how to use them for specific applications and where they can succeed, where they don't succeed, is really worth a lot. And that's really where you get the competitive advantage. And the companies we have talked to as the Virtual Brain founders have been very excited about that particular opportunity. Because the soft, the solutions itself are out there already. They can grab it from a paper, no problem there. But it's actually knowing where it works, where it doesn't work, learning how to use the software in the conjunction with AI platforms, for example. That's stuff that we've been working on. We can take that knowledge and actually help build the platforms together. And that's really a huge advantage for businesses. So thank you for that. Um, one of the uh, concerns, I, mean, I talked about it, but uh, we generally know the cost of developing a drug uh, is increasing and people are looking to neuroinformatics uh, and other tools to help address that. But those, a lot of the costs are in the clinical trials or something else. So are what you're producing, they'll be the cynic here, just added costs to the system, or are they actually, you know, do you see an opportunity here for this technology to start driving down the cost of actually doing these trials and bringing a new drug to market? Let me give a shout out to that just for a second. Thank you. You know, I think uh, there are so many components to clinical trials and to research and to <laughs> clinical precision medicine. And by the way, I think behavioral health is the ultimate use of precision medicine. There are so many pieces where one has to go out and, or the drug companies spend a fortune to go out and to develop a cohort and the rest of it. You know, at the end of the day, the reason we're doing all of this ourselves is to accelerate into clinical practice the things that we're all learning. So we've worked, for example, to be able to kind of back-end feed some very, very large healthcare systems with clinical research data. And since there is no ICD-9 or ENM code, we kind of wrote web interfaces, drove it into the back-end, and allowed to have reporting within the EMR and other systems. So it was unified clinical research management system and healthcare system. If you do that, all of a sudden you're in control of the data and you can reduce cost. You can take the control out of these people who are trying to develop the cohorts and adding extraordinary cost to clinical trials. So you can't use data until you can manage data. The objective is to manage it. And then there'll be some private uh, apps and you know, people who develop these applications deserve the recognition and monetary enhancement that they get. Uh, it's not a battle. I think it's a combination of IP, open source, and open science. And that's the mix that we really have to reach. And then let's accelerate these things into clinical practice. We all know people practice medicine the way they were trained to practice medicine. The only way you can escalate it is evidence-based data that drives them to do the right thing. So uh, I'm going to talk about more uh, Alzheimer's application or Alzheimer's clinical trial, but uh, the, basically the, the, there is ways to uh, reduce the cost for the clinical trial or fast track a little bit some of the, the, the process. Basically the main cost in uh, clinical trials is in recruitment, uh, screening people to make sure that they, they have the right properties for the trial 
and more often than other, especially in Alzheimer, uh, they recruit people that don't have the desired quality, uh, like cognitive decline. They should cognitively decline in the, ter the time of the, the trial. If they don't, or like if they stay stable, they will just add noise to the, the clinical trial, resulting in increased cost. So if you're able to target the right population that will cognitively decline or reject the ones that will, that, that will remain stable, uh, that's a great way to uh, ensure that if the drug is effective, um, it's going to go through the, the whole process. If it's not, then it's not due to the uh, wrong selection of, uh, of your subjects or too much noise or uh, a sample size that is uh, too small for the heterogeneity of your population. So yeah, there is ways to, to reduce the cost uh, of clinical trial, I think quite drastically. And if you do that earlier on in the screening process, then you also like save a lot in the, the most costly um, modalities that you will do at the end of the process. So you know, another, another way you can think about cost reduction is um, by increasing the uh, resolution of your measurements or the quality of your measurements by do, potentially doing more regular measurements with at-home technology, wearable technology that costs a lot less than a laboratory visit. Um, so if you can collect data remotely for a clinical trial, you can, you can potentially um, at least achieve some of the outcome measures, um, some of the health measures that you're, you're looking for um, remotely and at a much lower cost and much more regularly. So you can, you can actually look for where these changes are happening, what, what the time course of them is longitudinally. Um, a good example of this is, say, sleep measurement. If sleep is one of your outcome measures, or if you're running a sleep clinic, uh, I, I don't know if anybody here has ever been to a sleep clinic, but it's an awful experience. And sleeping, sleeping in a polysomnography system is terrible. Um, not only are you, you know, sleeping with wires all over yourself and accelerometers and respirometers, um, but you basically can't move at night. So people don't sleep well. So you're actually getting a measure that's not very indicative of any kind of pathology associated with sleep. And you know, there are a lot of reasons to believe, Randy was telling me last week, that, um, that sleep is, a, is an interesting indic indicator potentially of, of early cognitive decline, um, biomarker for Alzheimer's. But it's also, you know, ho for a host of other reasons, it's a really interesting thing. If you can make something sparse and wearable that someone can wear at home and sleep multiple nights in, then you can get um, sleep data, EEG, EMG, um, heart data, breathing data, um, a whole bunch of other things, uh, all uh, on, a, on a, a longitudinal basis that you can average over multiple nights or you can look at multiple nights in the time course of this and see, uh, you get actually more robust data at a lower cost without having to, without, without having the cost of a laboratory, uh, without having the cost of administering all this equipment and having, and potentially, you know, marrying that with um, robust AI classifiers for, or sleep classifiers or data classifiers, um, you can do a lot of the data scoring automatically um, and, and remove a lot of the human element from, um, from, from data scoring. Um, I want to get down to a more sort of fundamental level on that as well. So one of the things that, in my perspective at least, that um, hasn't really been considered is, is whether the theoretical framework underlying clinical trials is really taking into consideration how complicated, if you will, and complex the system is we're trying to cure. And, and I think um, we've, we've been sort of using the, the fundamental rule that there's going to be a single cure for a single disease, and that's most of the times wrong. And uh, sort of looking for that magic bullet, looking for that one thing that's going to change everybody's life is, is not a good way to proceed with clinical trials. So the alternative framework is to actually go back and think about how does the entire system work. And it's actually a complex system. It's a very nonlinear system. Um, we had sessions today talking about dynamical systems and talking about the complexity and emergence and so on and so forth. And that skill set is actually quite useful to think about how things that happen in your brain relate to things that happen in your body, things that happen, that happen in your environment, to your genes, and so on and so forth. So you think about how to use that knowledge then to, to, to guide your clinical trial to do a bit more work on personalizing and putting precision medicine. That may change, in fact, how we do clinical trials because we're using much more information about the individual Instead of selecting only a small number of individuals ultimately for a clinical trial, you can look at everybody and actually make use of these wonderful frameworks we're putting together for both AI, for biological um, modeling of systems like virtual brain that take into consideration the complexity of the system, try and use that to really understand how these different systems interact, to provide better solutions that ultimately will help the individual as opposed to helping one person out of a thousand. 
So one part of the puzzle is we want more drugs and we want them cheaper and we want them sooner. Uh, but the other part is on the innovation side. So at least uh, most of you, other than Randy, are in firms. Um, most of you are in Canadian firms. How do we keep you here? So we see that the normal trajectory for a Canadian company is you develop your product with lots of public money to support you at the early phases. You get some private money, you prove proof of concept, and then you sell to the US or Europe or something. What can the government do to keep you here? I would say the first thing, and you know, for, for Element, one of the things that's been um, one of the drivers of our growth in Canada has been the talent pipeline. So <clears throat> continuing that, that training, uh, continuing to foster an open environment between the universities and the firms here, I think is a very important part of it. Um, I think you know, we're never going to have the venture capital, um, or at least for the foreseeable future, we won't have the same venture capital uh, abilities here as we do in the U.S., um, and th that's not a problem that throwing money at will necessarily solve. So it's great to get venture capital from, uh, from the government, but it doesn't come with the same networks and expertise that uh, a seasoned venture capital firm will bring to the table along with that money. Um, I think in terms of AI, one of the things that will really uh, help Canadian firms succeed is if we find ways to structure data trusts or um, you know, data banks that are available to Canadian uh, emerging companies. So if we find ways to leverage the data that the Canadian government or uh, you know, Canadian people operating on Canadian soil are creating, whether it's through actually taking government data or creating you know, sort of a data tax on companies operating here and making that available to companies in a way that's obviously privacy preserving, that'll help the Canadian operations of these different companies take off. And I think that's one of the ways that we really have to be forward thinking. It's not a way of operation that's really been done before. But I think in order to really compete on the global stage, uh, that's one of the things that Canadian companies are going to need. You know, I, I think that's a great question. and. Uh, Canada generally, Quebec specifically, has attracted tremendous industry here. And many of our partners, you know, uh, Google, Microsoft, to name a few, um, are here and they're here for a reason because they have access to, to brilliant people, they have access to data. Uh, so part of the initiative that we're working on is to try to keep things that are positive uh, in Canada as part of our alliance. We're bringing Intel into the mix. We're bringing Microsoft into the mix, which is which is working on very interesting AI issues. Not so much the actual AI capability, but the massive parallelism to be able to pull that data in. So at, le at least it's our objective to try to work within Canada and keep things in Canada. We're looking at companies and working with companies here. Uh, one that was uh, that was displaying outside is uh, Euron Digital Pathology, uh, which worked with Alan and uh, Katrin and Ehrlich Germany when we did the big brain data set. So we're trying to take that and project it, expand it first within Canada. I mean, one of the things we'll do, one of the good things about Dell is we're a go-to-market company. We, we don't compete with our partners. We try to have a joint go-to-market to drive them. So one of the things we would do is come up with a simple story, drive a simple story to our sales reps, have them tell the simple story to their customers, and try to drive and propagate systems that are developed in Canada, within Canada, and then obviously elsewhere, hopefully to return revenue to Canada. So, so yeah, um, I mean, one of the things I think we have to do uh, is just start believing that there, this can be an industry. Um, this can be a big industry. We know what the economic costs of, of brain disease are going to be if they're not already. Um, the, the solutions to this are going to be incredibly costly and incredibly profitable for whoever comes up with viable businesses to serve these needs. Uh, so. Uh, you know, we've got Dell here um, telling us how awesome neuroscience in Canada is. Two days ago at um, the International Federation on Aging at, in Toronto, uh, uh, there was a fellow from the Dementia Discovery Fund who said, yeah, I'm taking meetings all over Canada because, you know, this is such a special place in neuroscience. Um, you really punch so far above your weight. 
if we don't, we should almost be embarrassed if we don't become the global cluster of, of neurotechnology and of brain health companies. Uh, we've got all of the advantages. You know, academically, we're, 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 we're there. Scientifically, we're there. When you look at the work that's being done at the, the neuro and at uh, OBI with the brain code database in aggregating all of this patient data from all over an entire province with a single payer system, uh, we really should be able to pull this off. Um, and even venture capital, even access to capital is getting a little better, even if it might never be as good as it is in the U.S. Uh, I think if we can believe it, then, you know, it'll start to actually happen. People have to be willing to take a few risks. Um, students have to be, like, looking around at different career opportunities, creating roles for themselves in the private sector. Um, and this will just, it's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen somewhere. And it, there's every reason why it should happen in Montreal and Toronto. Here, here. Yeah, I mean, I concur with the other ones. Uh, the, uh, the data is very important and to facilitate access to data and not like duplicate the work, let's say. Uh, if I go to one hospital to get some data and then another one or even like in different, uh, in different subfield of a specific hospital, um, we have a great cluster, um, academic cl cluster in Canada and, and in Quebec and in Montreal. And we, and we all want to transit that, uh, that research to, uh, to some application that may be at some point game changers, but we need to, 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 to take care of those, uh, of those uh, new initiatives and uh, provide them with the, the right support. Uh, data is one of them, a big one actually. And uh, I mean, the US market is much bigger, but we have this, uh, if we can support and give the, the, the right data and the right support to those company, I think it's not gonna be a problem to, they don't need to, even if they have money or capital from the US, it's not a problem, they can stay here in Montreal or elsewhere. And even if their market is in the US, they can still stay here as long as there is some incentive or some justification. Like if the talent pool is here, that's, a, that's one of the, the big incentive. And the other one I think is mainly the, uh, the data. Okay, well I promise that you get to, you would have to ask questions of each other. I gave you lots of time. Uh, so who wants to start? You can be to a particular person or the entire panel. How are we doing for time? Does the audience get a chance to? Well, they're not lining up at the microphones. <laughs> ah, if we want to go to the microphone, go to the microphone, and then we'll go to you guys, and then come back here. Ah. So I entered the, the hole just a little bit apparently after you started your talk, and I'm puzzled by this expenses for creating IP is going higher and higher and the profit is going lower and lower. I can see that this happens in a drug manufacturing, uh, but I don't see why it would happen in computation, you know, compute, uh, computers, software, uh, AI, etc. because at the end, it's computers that do not cost much and it's mainly the manpower. I don't see why and I believe you mentioned that this happens in all sectors, not only the drug manufacturer. Maybe you can explain that. Yeah, it's not that profits go down, so individual firms uh, aren't necessarily doing uh, worse. It's that um, the, the cost of doing the same degree of research, if you want, or the same contribution is going up. So as long as you know, individual firms will succeed, within that by, by spending the money and we'll get it out. But overall, when you look at across the economy, we're not getting the economic growth out of um, our investments in research. And that's what's driving governments to invest in research, which is, in the end, they're hoping for some type of economic growth. That is declining. That is, whatever we're researching is not contributing uh, in the way that, we, that that t technology in the early 20th century contributed to economic growth. Uh, so we're failing to translate it as part of it. Um, but the research is becoming more complicated. Uh, it requires larger staffs and, and is being sustained so far because we're putting more money into it. The question becomes when that money dries up, you know, and we just had the budget increase a lot for at least public sector research, um, 
when we go back in three to five years and tell the government again there's not enough money into it, at some point they may say no, and what's going to happen to the industry? So we're not at a crisis point today, but the data is showing that we need to be, find ways to reduce the costs, and we're hoping that open science and informatics and so on can help us drive down those costs and be more productive. So it's more of a warning sign uh, because obviously there are a lot of companies that make money now. So it's a counterintuitive story I'm telling you because you look around, you hear about the iPhone, you hear about all kinds of stuff. It looks like innovations everywhere, but it's actually contributing less to the economy than we would like. Um, and in the healthcare sector, we obviously see this with increasing percentage of our provincial budgets and federal budgets going to, or at least provincial budgets going to healthcare. Again, a sustainability problem. We'll have to see in the longer term. It, it's happened across most industries. Uh, frankly, this is too new a sector for anybody to make any firm conclusions about this sector, right? You'd need a longer history to be able to see what's happening compared to others. Uh, so it might be an exception in this sector, but it's still an overall problem. But the other thing about this sector is it's adopting open methods right from the beginning. Uh, and so perhaps it will uh, overcome some of these problems because it often, if we look at the Montreal community, the reason we have such a vibrant community is because we were open at the beginning that brought people in and dealt with, gave the industry some of the things they wanted. So maybe this industry is doing the right thing, but we won't know for 10 years until data starts accumulating. Uh, I think a, a couple of general comments about your question. Uh, what does all of this technology bring to us? How does it help us? And I, I guess, uh, first of all, uh, clinical trials are typically incredibly inefficient engines. A pharmaceutical company asks a very, very limited set of questions of a data set, and if the drug doesn't work, then they essentially put that data on the shelf. Increasingly, we're in a position where they can share their data why would they do that? Why would they give it away to the other guys? Well, the other guys are putting data in too, so everybody can win. If you have a slight shift in your mentality that uh, we can explore preclinically, uh, with a, a, a pre-competitively, sorry, with a lot of data that we would have otherwise had to find ourselves. So I think that accelerates the process. You've got lots more people asking questions of the data. Um, look at ADNI. Instead of three people asking data of that data set in a closed sense, it's been made open, and hundreds, indeed thousands, of people have explored that data set with all kinds of findings. So that's a, an obvious case in point. The second point I'd, I'd like to, to add is that uh, tr traditional models of clinical trials are very much stratified. Um, we have to make everybody look the same so we can test the impact of this drug, which is, you know, it, it, the, dr the drug has been applied to left-handed white males. It's not generalizable beyond that. As a left-handed white male, I think that's great, but it doesn't really help other people. Now you put it out there and people can start to look at not tightly stratified data. They can allow masses of comorbid uh, patients to be uh, studied in such a way that you can explore much more subtle aspects of, of comorbidities in a way which the typical clinical trial doesn't allow. And the, the CCNA, the Canadian Consortium for Neurodegeneration and Aging, does exactly that. I thought that it was a very bad idea when they first decided to throw all the patients into, into the mix. Now it turns out that that's actually a great vehicle for AI and, and precision medicine and, and more sophisticated analytic techniques to tease out those, comorbid, those mechanistic components rather than sticking everybody in a common label. You've got Alzheimer's disease, you've got vascular dementia. Those things increasingly don't apply anymore, and we're going to look to AI to give us a much more mature perspective on the disease process. Both of those things, the type of data and the analytics you apply, start here in this kind of forum. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, great panel, thanks a lot. Um, so I had a question about uh, the legal implications of AI with respect to liability. So as AI technologies are sort of coming to market in a serious way, there's major questions related to who's responsible if AI fails. And as health companies who, uh, whose technologies impact actual patients, how do you think about liability, uh, legal liability with respect to AI? Is it something that you're concerned about? Or are you just waiting to see what happens with respect to courts and uh, what laws will we pass in the future? So it really depends on your claims, basically. Uh, if you want to have like an autonomous AI that will diagnose you without any intervention of a medical doctor, then definitely this is something that you need to consider very strongly because you will have repercussion because you're the, the last line, basically, of defense uh, before the diagnosis. Um, most of AI applications are uh, assistive tools uh, to provide more information to uh, the physician. Uh, and at the end, the decision and the final diagnostic is done by the, by the, the physician. So uh, in terms of liability, uh, you circumvent a little bit uh, that part. That said, it's not an exception. It's not a good reason to do a poor job or have a... Um, algorithms that uh, actually uh, have like very bad results, like you still need to validate that, uh, make sure that they do generalize on many type of uh, population. Uh, as Alan uh, was mentioning, to have a diverse pool of subjects that are very heterogeneous that like you, you make sure that you don't have a false positive and stuff like that. Uh, but that those things can be measured as long as you have the data to measure them or you have access to that data. Yeah, and I would add just more generally, you know, outside the scope of uh, AI and health, I think there's a lot of um, you know, there, there's a lot of conversation about what that means in terms of liability. Uh, there's a lot of sort of doomsday scenarios that are being thrown out. There's a lot of talk about you know killer robots and you know if a robot does this, I think we tend to attribute um, more personality to to AI systems than they actually have in in the wider community, and that's something that we have to sort of uh, fight against. The fact is that most of the time, uh, these questions will be solved either contractually or uh, by policy. So, you know, a really good example is uh, no-fault insurance in uh, in Quebec and Canada. So, for for you know, people had these questions about, you know, if, if a car is driving and it hits someone who's responsible, it's just much simpler on a societal to societal level to say, okay, this is how we're going to deal with it as long as there wasn't negligence on the part of the, uh, the AI developers, and as long as, you know, as you said, you're, you're doing it responsibly, you're using the proper data, there is licensing, um, you know, there's licensing regimes in place to make sure that no one's just launching a bunch of cars. Uh, it's a societal shift that's happening. We have to deal with it uh, from the policy standpoint, and there are places where the, you know, policy isn't there yet. But I think the, the large-scale deployment of these technologies also isn't there yet, and we just have to make sure that that goes hand in hand, but it's not gonna be one of these scenarios where no one knows how to address their liability and no one knows, um, sort of no, no one knows who's gonna be ultimately responsible. The legal principles we have in place still do apply for AI solutions. Um, well, there's a question over here and then after that, okay, this one's yeah, one issue that uh, I haven't heard brought up, everyone's commented on how important it is get, to get access to the data, but I'm a researcher in one of the institutes in Toronto. And I spend huge amounts of my time interacting with lawyers on data transfer agreements and worrying about why the REB at that particular institution desperately wants to add a sentence to the consent form. It's got a little better in Ontario with Clinical Trials Ontario, but we have different legal frameworks for privacy in each of the provinces in Canada. So we desperately need, in my opinion, and I'm curious to see what the panel thinks, the government to actually get its act together and fix the legal environment in which we're operating in because we seem to be way ahead of where the law is and the law is way ahead of the people often we end up interacting with within the institutions in terms of what they know about what's allowed versus what we're actually trying to do. 
Yeah, and it's not just within Canada, it's between countries too, with, well, with Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Canada's <laughs> reviewing its privacy law, and we've got the two levels. I mean, one of the things when I mentioned open SciNet uh, is we're trying to figure out um, can we simplify the, I mean, there, there are two parts. One is getting the consent of the patient, but then there's the sharing of the data itself. So even if we get the right type of consent, doesn't mean we can make the data available. And what happens if in five years we discovered, oh, we should have done it a little bit differently. We don't want to have to reconsent the, the patient, we have to find other mechanisms. So Bartha Knoppers at the Center uh, for Genomics is you know, one of the things they're looking at is that. But I don't know if other people want to. Uh, and you've got a federalism issue, which is not resolvable. But I don't know if. Uh, yeah. um, I, I would say, you know, I definitely understand that concern. The fact is most, um, most technology companies today do operate globally. They'll collect data, you know, at least somewhat globally. They'll have global markets. The, the standard practice is to comply with the highest standard. And we're lucky in Canada that for a long time we had one of those higher standards. So we got used to being a little more protective of data, which made it so that uh, when GTB, GDPR came into effect, most firms here were already pretty compliant with that higher standard. The, that one of the issues is that I think as a profession, uh, privacy law is something that was not really taught, thought about, um, practiced in a really meaningful way up until recently. And so I think like what, what you'll see a lot of people sort of being really hesitant to make changes to the form or insisting on inserting this language that they got from their outside counsel that they paid a fortune for and don't want to go back to is a lack of understanding of the interplay between these laws and these new laws and the technology itself. And once you understand that full data flow and how it works as a lawyer, it makes it much easier to be a bit more flexible. And as a profession, we're not there yet, and I think that's something that we have to work on. I don't know if you agree, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can graduate law school without taking IP, let alone knowing anything about consent laws, so. Uh, um, so you may not be the right group of people to ask this to, but one of the biggest problems with ensuring that data are, that are generated inside of universities uh, are available is the sustainability of these data resources. And this is not a problem that governments have solved. Uh, it's not something the research community has um, figured out themselves because you ask any individual researcher if they want part of their budget to go to infrastructure, they'll say no. So uh, industry, on the one hand, um, can benefit from this data, and clearly, you know, we have to do things a little bit better in the academy to have that happen. But do you see scenarios developing where industry can help with this problem? Because it's really a, a global, it's a, it's a global issue. I don't know of any field that is not facing this. That's just a great question. And, and I think uh, of all the things that we're going to try to do, uh, through this partnership with McGill is exactly that. How do, you, um, how do you sustain a model so you can retain that data for long periods of time? How can you secure it? How can you audit it? And how can you have people come together to share data and then preserve that data set? That's at the very core of, of what we're gonna to try to do here at McGill. And uh, my belief is, is that if we do this properly in the long run, It'll be significantly less expensive. There'll be higher utilization of the IT that you have, and there'll be a much better outcome. Misha and I talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, I, I think if we can build the IT systems to be able to, to, to adequately secure and sustain the data, and then we can have issues around ethics and data sharing oval, and data gravity overlaying that, will have a unique combination. So that really is why I'm here. I think that's the number one issue uh, which will accelerate all of the things. <laughs> yeah, and, and, the, and the idea is to not do that at all. The idea is to just have it in a containerized environment which is owned by the people who own the data but you can micro-segment that little environment so that small environment is owned by who owns it, not by industry. So clearly, 
the objective here is not to, uh, to, to own and control the data, but to allow the people who have the data, or have interacted with the data with other people, to be able to prove they did what they did, and then be able to keep it themselves either individually or institutionally. That's really the holy grail, and that's where we're going. So uh, another answer to that is that um, if you look at the incentive structure of, uh, for, for data flow or for you know, the creation of tools, um, ultimately the solution of code sharing was not solved by an open source nonprofit initiative. It was, it was solved by GitHub. Um, and then they sold for $8 billion. Um, and you know, there, the, eventually this is probably going to happen to the, the there's, there's every reason to believe that this can happen to the, the standardization and storage and, and maintenance of, of data. Um, you know, something that venture capitalists like to say, I listen to probably too many of them, um, but they, one of the things that they like to say is if you're a hardware company, um, you know, you, you're, you're, you're worth two times your revenue. If you're a software as a service company, you're worth five times your revenue. If you're a data flow company and you're doing AI on your data um, and you've got a lot of data coming in, you're, you're worth 10 times your revenue. Um, so there's every reason to believe that, that uh, the standardization of data uh, will be incentivized to happen in the private sector and that, you know, that rather than trying to charge you for storing data, they'll give it to you free and then do a bunch of machine learning and make you dependent on them um, and make everybody dependent on them. Uh, you know, we th we've thought about you know, how do we Maybe we don't just make our cloud, and we have a poster on our cloud architecture and how we do data science. What if we just open up our cloud to everybody who wants to store EEG data, and then we figure out how to make better tools? Um, then we're the ones who have all the EEG data. Wouldn't that be cool? And it's cool from a scientific perspective, but it creates some interesting perverse incentives. Um, you know, and, the, and, I, and, and, I, and I'm, a, I'm a proponent of open science. There are probably lots of people out there who are thinking about this with brain data and with pharma data. Um, who are you know, maybe not so uh, benevolently motivated, I guess? That's exactly right. I mean, that's true of all of the consumer, all of the big tech. Yeah. yeah. Fundamentally, if you can't control, audit, maintain, and secure your own data, then we're going to be talking about this 10 years from now. When people talk about the cloud, they talk about all these other issues. Once it's gone, it's out of your control, and uh, the game is over. So fundamental basic tools that allow control, security, auditing, your own control of your own data, that's where immediate focus has to take place. Yeah, and if I could just point out that Canadian government is currently reviewing uh, its data strategy. Uh, so given that you are data consumers, you should pay attention. And this is being driven by concerns that our data is being handed over to uh, non-Canadian entities, um, specifically around Toronto. Um, but the government is actively looking at this. Europe is ahead of us in terms of thinking about this. They've developed the Open Science Cloud, uh, so a whole e-infrastructure designed to support data without having uh, the worries about uh, control. So do we want that? Do we want more of a hybrid? Uh, these are all open questions. Uh, Canada, in terms of policy development, is considerably behind um, most of our competitors. Um, and so, you know, one of the open questions is what can government do here? And I think an e-infrastructure is clearly uh, part of what the government ought to be doing, not only to provide the data, but also all the governance mechanisms around it, and it hopefully helps solve some of the consent issues. And, and I would add one thing that uh, isn't, probably isn't thought about very often in these circles, but um, that this is one of the things that competition law should be addressing. Um, there, there was a, a review recently in the last few years of the Competition Act, and in the first drafts of it, they focused a lot on data and you know, players who have dominant market positions in terms of data and what that meant and whether there should be positive licensing obligations on that type of player, how 
that could be done. Um, so the, there was sort of a beginning of conversation about that. Um, to no one, you know, to any, no septic surprise anyway, the next version of that paper did not contain that. I think there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of lobbying around that um, and being, you know, as Richard said, being aware, paying attention, having a conversation about the importance of uh, competition in the data field is something that's very important. Okay, we've hit, uh, well, we've hit our time limit. I'm looking to our, our organizer. I follow instructions. Uh, well, we have one more, one more yeah. question. Okay. okay, we'll take one more question because I've been given permission okay. to have it asked. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh, Quick, uh, how about I ask, bo both of you ask your question and then we'll put it to the panel. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I, um, I'm kind of surprised I haven't heard the magic word blockchain yet. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, I'm not mocking you. As I've worked in it for many years, it has to do with things you're talking about. Um, data provenance, uh, data security, data accessibility. Um, you can sort of think of a, a blockchain as this, this uh, global database that nobody owns. Uh, it's like a whiteboard in the cloud where people uh, sign documents and they're indelible. Um, and just a little example, um, for example, uh, now if I wanted to get my dental records, instead of trying to go through this siloed proprietary dental office database, I could have my dentist sign and encrypt my documents and put them in the cloud. No one can see them, but I mean, no one can interpret them but me. Um, I know they're there. If I want to sign them over to a new dentist, I can do it at any time. This really, I mean, th there's, a, there's a whole world of possibilities related to blockchain that I think people should maybe, maybe you are, I don't know, but I haven't heard the word yet, so. <laughs> well, you know, thanks for the layup on that, because I agree, blockchain is uh, perhaps the most important technology out there. Uh, blockchain and Splunk both. Uh, so we're working with uh, blockchain, uh, there was an indication in one of the slides that I passed, we're working in blockchain both in the healthcare life sciences business as well as the financial business. It's probably the most important technology out there, and very important in consenting as well. You can track all of that across the enterprise. So at the end of the day, uh, the kinds of things we're talking about, containerizing data and using blockchain to overcome a lot of these problems is likely the answer. And um, some of the big uh, payers in, uh, or insurance companies in the states are really beginning to aggressively use blockchain and Splunk for the very reasons that you're suggesting. Thank you. There was one. Yeah. Hi, so um, thanks a lot to the panelists. It's a great discussion. I'm following on really from the question that came from somewhere over there about liability. And there was an analogy made with um, self-driving cars regulations, and this is a very you know, emerging area and so on. But um, I mean, what I'm really curious about, and maybe I suppose maybe Sonia, but I, I guess all you guys can speak to it, is in terms of informing the clinical decision-making process with new AI-based technologies or non-AI-based technologies, whatever, but something that's not gone through the, the kind of canonical scientific validation process, um, what is, what it, how do you, um, in terms of the discussions you have with the clinicians, how, how do you kind of propose to inform and improve the clinical decision-making process? And then just a kind of small follow-on to that is, if there's a clinician who has like 10 AI companies who all have a, a product that is claiming to you know, give them some improvement in their diagnosis, is there kind of an issue that could be coming on the horizon if they, they get kind of saturated? Is this something that is, you know, You've given some thought to. Uh, yeah, good question. So we actually do enforce the, the traditional clinical validation pathway, which is why we, we started doing those clinical trials like I had mentioned earlier. And um, what was the other part of your question? Sorry, I'm blanking. Okay, yes. So a, a lot of it actually isn't a to, in clinical decision-making support systems, a lot of it is not actually related to the advancement that AI can bring, but rather enforcing measurement-based care in clinical practice, and especially in psychiatry, making sure that you know, clinicians are reporting and, and 
or, and collecting standardized reporting measures of their patients um, in a way that is aggregated somehow and, and then used to inform decisions. And a lot of it then goes into the interpretability, um, t ability, the abilities of interpretability of on, uh, are able to interpret AI decisions and what sources of data and evidence base that an AI algorithm draws upon to suggest a certain treatment and to make that available to the clinician in an accessible format. You know, you know, you know we, all, we all talk about big data, big data, big data AI and all the rest of it. Small data is also a very good thing. You know, population health and other things really bring forward issues that are invisible and particularly in behavioral health, and I call the behavioral health people the invisible patients because there's not necessarily in the record any kind of designation that really suggests that they've got a problem, but there are other markers such as obesity or, uh, or other issues, asthma, diabetes, and the comorbidities that indicate that that person needs behavioral health uh, help to get them off the couch to get them back into a productive environment. So, you know, we're working with Hopkins uh, using their, uh, their ACGs uh, grouping technology to be able to do exactly that kind of work. So there are so many simple things here that we can do without leaping towards really the exotic where we can really make a dramatic change. I think with that, I, we are preventing you from drinking. Um, so thank you to my co-panelists, and I'll turn it over to Elena to advise you where to get those said beverages. Yes, so again, huge thanks to all of our panelists. I think they deserve a big hand. We still got good stuff left, though, for the day. Poster session starts now. There's drinks and uh, canapes or something along those lines outside, so please check out all of the posters and demos. Uh, and then we have the social tonight. The information should be in your programs book. So after the post poster session, please join us at the uh, venue uh, for more drinks and more food and live jazz. So thanks for today, you guys.